Welcome to our semiconductor education program. This is Vincent Chan. Today we are going to continue what we learned from the previous previous lecture around CMOS up hand and focus on the high frequency response. Two stage CMOS up hand, part two, high frequency response. Let's quickly go through the low frequency analysis we learned from the previous lecture. Right? Make sure you have no question at all around the low frequency analysis. So green Norton, blue Norton, Norton equivalent. So tra two transconductances and two output resistances. The capital R1, capital R2. Now here's the overall low frequency gain. Low frequency gain. Okay? The product of two capital transconductance and uh, the R1 times the R2. So now, let's start with the low frequency equivalent circuit. So now let's move forward. Miller capacitance is called Miller compensation, right? This is the Miller compensation. Remember what you learned from the Miller compensation? There is a compensating capacitor connected across the feedback path of the what stage? Of the gain stage. Of the gain stage. So across the feedback path of the gain stage. But there's still an internal capacitance. The internal capacitance at the interface of first stage and the gain stage, which is the C1. So C1 represents the total capacitance at the interface between first stage and the second stage. And also there's the output capacitance, the total capacitance at the output node. So sometimes, so often, if especially when the output drive to external periphery, peripheral circuit, then it will involve the low capacitance. In this situation, the C2 will be much higher than C1, right? I just want to let you know, C2 usually is not involved, only involve the internal transistor parasitic capacitances, and also will include the load capacitance. All right. So this is the total picture, the total equivalent circuit of the high of the CMOS up hand, two stage CMOS up hand. So now let me ask you the first question: Where is the dominant pole frequency? Or is there a dominant pole frequency? Where is the dominant? If if so, where is the dominant pole frequency? What is the dominant pole frequency? Just, uh, just answer this question. So I, I'm, I'm asking you to pause for three minutes to think about this. Okay? So capture this. Screenshot. Where is the dominant pole frequency? I'll be back in three minutes. So what's the dominant pole frequency? Where the dominant pole frequency located? To answer this question, of course we can use the Miller approach, but in the future analysis lesson, we especially when I talk deeper around the, the compensation, Miller compensation, you also know zero is gonna play an important role. So we want to take this opportunity to make things right. All right? So let's start with the high frequency transfer function. So here's the high frequency transfer function. So where did you learn this? Where have you learned this? You learn from the when I teach the Miller compensation, right? Miller compensation is very, very, it's almost the same, except the input current source, the input, the input current source. But anyway, you, you figure out figure, figure out the difference, the minor difference by yourself between this one 
And the previous circuit, I teach around the subject of on the subject of Miller compensation. Okay, so the stability and the Miller compensation. I remember there are three lectures around the Miller compensation subject. But anyway, so now where is the dominant pole frequency? Before we solve this, answer this. Let's quickly review what, how we solve this when we study Miller compensation. We use an assumption, the dominant pole assumption, and then we got the two pole frequency. And then it can further support this assumption. So it's called a self-consistent approximation, right? So we see the omega HP1, which is the dominant pole frequency of this CMOS up end. The dominant pole frequency of this CMOS up end. And if you are sensitive enough, you should be able to know the middle term dominates, right? Why? Why? Because there's the gain factor embedded inside this term. Where's the gain factor? The GM times R2. GM times GM2 times R2. What is the GM2 R2 represents? The gain of the common source amplifier. The gain of the common source amplifier. So for this reason, the omega HP1 can be rewritten as, as what? As what? Let me test you. As what? Follow me. Let's, let's, let's eyeball to eyeball, right? Forget about the circuit. Because the circuit is supposed to make in your brain. Okay? So omega HP1, what is the total resistance? R1. Put down this on your note. What is the total capacitance? C1? C1 is negligible. Feedback. CC. Times the gain factor. What is the gain factor? GM2, R2. Are you with me? Are you with me? Do you want me to repeat that? R1, CC, gain, GM2, R2. R1, Miller, gain. R1, R1, you see the R1? Miller, you see the Miller? Again, you see the gain, GM2, R2, right? You got it? Okay, so let me further illustrate what does that mean. With, let's cover this with a little bit of transparency, okay? And then R1, you see the R1? And C1 can be negligible. Why? Because CC got market multiplier is very big. So uh, apply the Miller, the CM represent what? The total Miller capacitance. CM represent the total Miller. Nineteen. So let's go back to maybe sixteen. Something went wrong with my. My this, 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 too sensitive. I didn't touch anything. But anyway, mm. 16, right? Slide 16. Let's go back to 14. Mm. What happened? Hold on. 14. Okay. So 14, circuit. And then 15. Miller, and then remember Miller's theorem. 1 minus k. 1 minus k. What is k? The gain. The gain. What the gain? Well, what is the gain? Negative gm2 r2. So negative gm2 r2. So this is the cm. The total Miller capacitance. 
So when I talk about a gain, I neglect the one. So one is negligible. So you see Miller and gain, and C1 is also negligible. C1, you see the C1 in the circuit? So last time, the last one, okay? Let me remind you one more time. R1, Miller, and game. Okay? This is the dominant pole frequency. Okay? Dominant pole frequency. So now, what about the unit again? Another frequency, this is, because when you think about the, the bolt plot, Dominant pole, right? And this is the unit gain frequency. Unit gain. When you study the operational improvised circuit, we use this quite often. The unit gain frequency. At what frequency the gain will fall to zero decibel? Will fall to the zero decibel. So low frequency gain, 1122. Two. And then remember, there is an embedded meaning associated with the unit gain frequency. On surface, it, it seems it looks like the frequency that where the gain falls to zero decibel. But the inside, the meaning of the unit gain frequency is what? It's the gain bandwidth product. The gain bandwidth products. So I hope you didn't forget this. Okay? Gain bandwidth product. So gain, the low frequency gain. The bandwidth, the three decibel bandwidth, the dominant pole frequency. So which one got cancelled out? R1 cancelled out. GM2 cancelled out. And then which one? All two got canceled out. So then you see the transconductance of the first stage divided by the Miller. Now, I'm going to show you a shortcut to get to this important performance parameter called unit gain frequency. Okay? I just proved I just proved this through, so, I don't want to say a long way, but uh, uh, it takes a few minutes, all right? All right? But now I'm going to teach you uh, kind of a few seconds to get this. This is called the integrator model and also the major takeaway of this lecture. The integrator model. What do you mean by that? We have come to the end, almost the end of the le lecture, okay? So pay attention. Just give me your attention. So you see the color. First of all, you see the color. Pink. See the color pink? You see the color blue? You see the color brown? Right? What does that mean? Okay. That means the engineering sometimes, actually many times, values approximation more. Why? Because it's too complicated. When it comes to hand analysis, you need the feeling. Okay? If you need a more accurate a precise result. Use the simulation, right? Use computer. So why you need to learn a hand analysis? Why? Why you need to learn a hand? You need to learn the concept, the feeling, the intuition. In, right? So you need a sort of intuitive skill. So now, you CC, I don't need to, I need to explain. The pink voltage control current source, I don't need to explain, just copy, right? But well, what is the 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 blue. The blue represents this. Because I talk about the gain, gain could be 200, 300, or 500 in a bipolar case. 
So it's big. Why not just think about infinite? It's very big. The gain stage, let's assume the gain stage, the gain of the second stage is very big to infinite. And then when the gain is infinite, means the input terminal of that gain stage can be treated as virtual ground. VG represents the virtual ground. Because it's the virtual ground, then we neglect, we neglect the R1 and the C1. Then, this is actually, if you ever learn the operational circuit, the differentiator, integrator, low pass filter, adder, the differential amplifier, etc., you know this. This is actually an integrator. Right, just quickly draw a Miller integrator on your note, right? The inverting configuration, up hand. Positive terminal grounded, inverting, resistor, feedback capacitor. So the input resistor is associated with this current source. Voltage control current source. So the transfer function of this, this model, you know what I'm doing? I try to give you a simplified model than this. The simpler, the simpler model than this, and which is shown in the left top corner, and which is called the integrator model. And the single ended out becomes what? The VO is the voltage between the upper terminal and the virtual ground. It's actually the capacitor drop. And what is the capacitor drop? We just get the current times the impedance. The current times the impedance. What is the current? The GMVD. So you get this. This is the approximate, the simplified transfer function. You get this simplified transfer function. So which is similar to what? An uh, integrator, if you're familiar with the integrator's frequency response, you are supposed to put this line, okay? So you put two, two curves, okay? The first one is, reality is this. This is the operational amplifier's frequency response. And this, let me show you. Just draw this, frequency response of the RPM. Another line is this, is integrator's frequency response. And I make sure these two coincide with each other. Okay? Okay? In other words, the high frequency behavior of a CMOS R band resembles an integrator. Okay, this is the concept behind this. And then if you command, if you let this gain equals to one, what is the corresponding frequency is gonna be? It's gonna be this. You let equals one and you get this. Exactly the same, okay? So to get the unit gain frequency, maybe you can skip this low frequency and the dominant frequency row path involve this calculation, you can simply adopt the integrator model, quickly get this, okay? This is also the major takeaway of this lecture. In the next lecture, I'm going to teach you about the offset voltage, how to cancel the systematic offset for this CMOS R band. So look forward to seeing seeing you in the next lecture. Thanks for watching.